person next to you, behind you, across from you. Take at least two minutes. Give him a hug that lasts at least two minutes and welcome him here. I had my birthday this past week. Uh, I turned 25. 25. Wow, that O made me feel really old. Um, but honestly, it's very interesting because um, it was probably like I, I haven't even been able to celebrate my birthday yet. And I've just been so stressed out and like overwhelmed, just a uh, full-time student and doing ministry as well and all these different things that I'm a part of and doing. Um, I'm just like, man, I, I have no time to celebrate my birthday. And so I guess this is uh, adulting. Uh, I guess this is me getting older. Um, does anybody even celebrate birthdays anymore? Uh, all right, so I should expect to not celebrate them anymore. All right, cool. Well, it was kind of a, a big learning curve for me. <laughs> Um, this past week as, as that happened. Um, but yeah, adulting now, it's, it's happening, it's happening. Um, and so anyways, I, I want to kind of go into this talk, but uh, just before, before I go into it, I've been on this journey of um, reading, through the, th- reading through the whole Bible, and I've, and I've got to admit to you guys, um, I've, I've never read through the whole Bible. I know a lot of stories and things like that, but I don't know like the full thing. I haven't read through it full thing. So it's been real awesome as the New Year's came along this year. Um, I was like, all right, um, let's see, let's see what this is about. Um, my girlfriend, she actually challenged me. Um, she she actually took it on, and I was like, hey, I would love to to join you in that. So she kind of led the charge into it, and so we've been reading through through the Bible, and so. Um, it has been incredible. If you haven't read through it and just, or maybe you need to reread through it because I believe that like in different seasons, the word speaks to you differently. Um, and so reading through Genesis and, and on and so forth and Exodus and just kind of seeing the story kind of develop of this faithful God um, and some of the, God, is, he's just so present. And he's there and these people continue to break his heart and he's trying to work with them and everything like that. It has been Absolutely beautiful. So kind of how, how the plan works is like you read from Genesis and then as you read a little bit from um, uh, Matthew and then a, a Psalm and a Proverb. Um, and I have got to admit that I'm sick and tired of Psalms. I can't do with it. I can't. David is probably, I think he's literally bipolar. I think there are some people who actually say he's bipolar. Like the man is so deep in his feels all the time. I mean like all ways. I'm like, David, you probably could have avoided this if you had just not looked over the edge and seen and gone forward with it. Or you could have just like, oh, man, he's just so, always so in his feels. And I'm like, all right, I need to take a break because this dude is kind of killing me right now. <laughs> I'm just being real. I'm just being real. And so, um, but for today, um, I'm going to focus on this story in Genesis, and it's the story of Joseph. Um, And that's where I'm going to base my message off of. And my message, the the title is called The Present is a Window into the Past. The Present is a Window into the Past. I'll read this first verse out of Genesis 50, verse 20. It says this. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. I can't put myself in the place of God. You plotted evil against me, but God turned it into good in order to preserve the lives of many people who are alive today because of what happened. 
You have nothing to fear. I will take care of you and your children. So he reassured them with kind words and touched their hearts. Let's pray one more time. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this cool morning, this beautiful weather. Lord, we thank you so much because you are a faithful God as well. Lord, that you are here and you're present in moments like this, Lord. Lord, I pray now as we go into this word and that we may have open hearts, yielded hearts, open minds, and ears to hear what you are trying to say today. Lord, use me as your mouthpiece. Not for fame or glory, Lord, but just to give you all honor. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So has anyone ever seen the, uh, the show on NBC called This Is Us? Any, any of you guys? Okay. All right. Come on. I, we got one person over there. Awesome. So This Is Us. All right. All right, Eddie. Sweet, sweet. So This Is Us. Um, it's literally been one of my favorite shows. Um, I, I, I used to have a list of, of favorite shows and um, probably not the, the, the most spiritual shows. You probably judge me. The Walking Dead was one of my favorites and things like that. But This Is Us is literally my, my new favorite show. And so I remember um, the first season uh, I was watching and literally within, I think, the first or two uh, episodes, I was just bawling. I was just crying. Uh, my family came in and, and uh, they just saw me crying and they're like, what's going on, Marcus? And I'm just like, I don't know. Um, you know, I'm just trying to cover up my tears. I'm like, men don't cry. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm all right. And, um, and I just like, I'm not all right. This show is like <laughs> hitting such a soft spot for me. And uh, so ever since then, it's been like the, the, the family show. Every single Tuesday we get together and we watch the show. We dialogue. We talk about it. We laugh. Um, we argue. We, I mean, it's just a beautiful thing. But kind of the premise of the show, for those of you who haven't seen it, it follows this family and it uncovers kind of their life and just them kind of going through life, through the motions of life. And it does all these awesome snapshots and things like that. It deals with uh, emotional past. It's honestly like such real things that we go through that we never talk about. And they do that in the show. And so, um, so yeah, last week... Um, there was just this phenomenal episode that I just saw and I just was able to catch up on dealing with the emotional past and going back in order to move forward. Going back in order to move forward. So Genesis 1, we're going back and we're going to be moving forward. Um, so starting with Genesis 1, I'll be reading from Genesis 1, um, chapter 1, all the way through chapter 50. So get ready. If you haven't read in the last month, we'll cover it all right now. Um, to give you some context of what we're going through. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to read that many chapters. You would be insanely bored. Um, but I'll give you guys like an expedited recap. So like, it's, like I said, it's been really cool to kind of be reading through the Bible and seeing all this genealogy and seeing this story and this line that God starts and, he, and he's just faithful with, with this group of people. And so... Um, to catch you up, Joseph was the 11th son. Does anybody know of who? That's awesome. Not ever. Jacob. So, yes, Jacob was also the guy who uh, finessed his brother um, out of uh, his, his birthright blessing. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he took advantage of his, his brother's hunger. Uh, his brother was, was very hungry that one day. If you guys remember the story, he wanted some soup. The soup must have been that good. He lost his, his blessing. So Jacob got that blessing. Later, Jacob um, was also the guy who, who wrestled with God and later was named Israel. All right. All right. Some of us know the story. So anyways, that's Jacob. And Joseph was the son, 11th son of Jacob. So it's a very kind of dysfunctional story, and we don't have enough time to kind of uh, a dysfunctional family, actually. <laughs> enough time to kind of uncover all of that. But um, so Joseph is this kind of, um, if I'm quite frank, he's kind of like a snobby kid. He's like that annoying uh, little brother that kind of snitches on you when you do like any little thing wrong. Um, and he kind of, uh, he's just that, he's just that, that kid, that brother. He's got the, he's got the nice coat on, 
Um, he talks about having dreams where the whole family's bowing down before him, like the audacity of this kid. Are you kidding me right now? The 11th, are you serious? And um, so his brothers are kind of just really angry at this, and, and they're just like fed up with this whole thing. And, and um, I guess naturally they think, well, what's the best thing we can do? Let's sell them into slavery. Like, that's probably the worst thing you can do. Like, so they, they end up selling him into slavery, and so it's pretty tough to imagine. Some people say that he was about 17 years old. My little brother, he's 17, and it's crazy to imagine, like, seeing him being sold into slavery. But they say that Joseph was about 17 years old, and he's sold into slavery. And just like that, his whole, his whole life just changes. From, from being that young boy in the fields of his father, tending to sheep, and now being pulled by a camel into slavery. So there he is. He's, he's in slavery. He ends up in Egypt working under Potiphar. And shortly after uh, working as, as a slave and working as a servant, Potiphar's wife ends up coming on to him, and she's trying to, um, I guess the word is uh, kick it, um, if any of you guys know the terminology of what I'm saying. She's trying to kick it with Joseph, and, and Joseph was like, no, nah, I'm good. Um, and she just doesn't get the hint. And so one day she ends up falsely accusing him of raping her, and all this stuff kind of happens. And now he's thrown into prison. So if it wasn't bad already, things just get worse. He's standing up for morals and, and, and being a good guy. And now he's thrown into prison for something he did not do. And they say that he was in prison for 13 years. 13 years. Talk about from bad to worse. Actually, just now that I'm thinking about it, just being like innocent and incarcerated, it's crazy. I just saw this movie uh, called Just Mercy, um, which was a phenomenal movie that kind of highlights just how many people are incarcerated um, that have been falsely accused and uh, it just kind of highlights the story of this, um, this lawyer fighting for these people. And I think it's such a beautiful thing and a replication of what God does for us. Um, and so anyways, that, that was just kind of just popped into my head as I was thinking Joseph was just completely innocent and he's just incarcerated for 13 years. So things go from bad to worse, but somehow he remained faithful to God. And then these two gentlemen come in and they're also incarcerated, and, and, and they're, they're in it, and they have these nightmares. And Joseph, he interprets these dreams for them, and he tells them one thing. He's like, just please remember me when you leave. And they leave, and they're back in the Pharaoh's palace, and they completely forget him. And so then one night, the Pharaoh has a dream and nobody can interpret it. And then eventually they remember, or one of them remembers, hey, there was this guy in prison. And so overnight, from interpreting a dream for Pharaoh, Joseph was made the second most powerful person in all of Egypt. So he's living life now. Are you guys following me with the story? I'm just trying to catch you guys up. Then we're going to go into it. So he's living life now, and he's doing great. He's the second man in command. He's got wealth. He's got so much, and he's... And, and, and he's kind of talked about this famine, and he's prevented it, and he's, he's doing all these plans, and he has a very high value. And then the famine comes, and his brothers that he hasn't seen in forever appear. This is the moment in the story where there's like this record screech, they're like, what? I wasn't expecting this. This kind of came out of nowhere. Where, where, where is this going? His brothers appear. His past came up. His past met him right there in front of his face, and he had to deal with it. And I think, I mean, if you're the second most powerful person in command, I mean, you can just tell other people, all right, off with their heads. I mean, you don't have to really deal with it. You can just say the word, and they're gone. But Joseph decides to do something different. He decides to deal with it. He decides to take it on personally because he had to go back in order to move forward. That present moment right there 
was a window into his past that he had to step through. See, I wonder how many of us today need to go back in order to move forward. Kind of a personal story. Last year I was in this season where I was really going back. I just, I just kind of fell in love with just, just going back to the start of, of just where, where my heart was when I first kind of encountered God and just those pure, unadulterated moments. Um, and so I just, just the simplicity of worship, I mean, just so much, those quiet moments, just going back into those small and just precious things. But part of it was also learning my history, was learning my family history. And so um, I would literally just sit down my grandmother and I'd be like, just tell me everything. I want to know everything. Um, tell me about you. Tell me about me. Uh, what was I like? I mean, you see all these like awesome like little Polaroid old photos and VHS players. Yes, I know what VHS cassettes are. I'm not that young. I guess I am old. Anyways. <laughs> and so I was just sitting down in front of my grandmother and my mom and just learning and just taking it all in and learning all these stories and, and their history. See, I believe that the more we know about our families, the more we know about ourselves. And the more freedom we have to make decisions about how we want to live. I'll say it again. And I believe I have a quote for that there so you can can read along with it too. It says, or I can just read it for you. Oh, there we go. The more we know about our families, the more we know about ourselves, the more freedom we have to make decisions about how we want to live. We can say, this is what I want to keep and this is what I don't want to bring with me into the next generation. So as I learn more about myself I realized that my story didn't start February 18th, 1995 in the downtown Orlando, Florida hospital. It started way before that. And just kind of a brief snapshot of that, my mom was 16 when she had me. She was 16 and, and my dad kind of fled the scene. And I can imagine all the stuff and pressures that was going through her head of trying to raise a kid at 16, single, She's still in high school, her whole life ahead of her, and all these people may be speaking into her. Your whole life is ahead of you. But she chose life, and God honored that, and I get to stand here today because of that decision she made. But fast forward 16 years from there, it's January 2012, and, and I'm in the doctor's office, and I've, and I've talked about my story dealing with testicular cancer, losing both of my grandparents and, and having my lung collapse. And it was the craziest time of my life. But even after getting healed from all of those things, there were still some things that I just was never healed from. There were still some past things that I just couldn't get over. There was these moments where I would experience just great depression and great anger and pain and anxiety, there were just some things I couldn't get past. God had done all those incredible things, but I was still hurting. I was still hurting. I had to go back in order to go forward. And part of that process was recognizing that I have some serious daddy issues. <laughs> I have some serious daddy issues. See, I traced down some of those feelings of anger, depression, anxiety, and I realized that it all stemmed back to my biological father. And that was always a part of my story that I never wanted to share or ever talk about. It was great to talk about those other things and the medical miraculous stuff that God did. But I never wanted to talk about how hurt I was because I had a dad out there that didn't want to claim me, that didn't want to love me, that didn't want to be present. 
I'd find myself crying a lot of nights, just wondering why. Like, what did I do to deserve this? And I would go into some very deep pits. <laughs> so, honestly, like I said, this was just last year. I ended up going to counseling and dealing with that. And it was a very deep and real process. I mean, just some deep crying. I mean, like stuff I just never knew I had pent up in me. But out of all my grieving and pain, I truly learned to forgive my father. God really gave me the eyes to see that my father, unfortunately, he comes from a, from a history, a genealogy of fathers that were never present. That they never decided to step up and into their families, and I had to learn to give grace. And I'm still in that process, guys. I'm still in that process because if I'm being completely honest with you, last year was awesome, and I learned to forgive him. But this is just being extremely honest. He texted me on my birthday. I haven't heard from him in a year or two. And um, it, was, it, was, it was very... It just said happy birthday, and I was just like, okay, thanks. I mean, I haven't heard from you in two years. And um, he, he ended up putting it on me as far as, like, it was my fault that I haven't heard from him in two years, and I just, I had some stuff that I had to say, and I just let it out. It's a process. I guess that's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say. It's a process of learning how to, to, to continue to be graceful, even when people don't deserve it. But I had to choose forgiveness because I know that it wasn't mine to carry this grudge, that I had a heavenly father who says I am more than enough, who says you are more than enough, and because of learning my past and going back to that place, I, I get to um, say I'll never be that to my kids. By the grace of God, that has been broken in the name of Jesus, that genealogy and that generational curse that has existed. See, I believe that um, in choosing forgiveness, you are restored. In choosing forgiveness, you are restored like never before. But part of that process, like I'm saying, is going back, going back in order to go forward. I have this other quote here. God never loses any of our past for his future when we surrender ourselves to him. Every mistake, every sin, every detour we take in the journey of life is taken by God and becomes our gift for a future of blessing for a future of blessing. He uses everything, everything. In his, in his sovereignty, he turns it for our good. I think oftentimes we forget, or, or we think that God forgets, but God never forgets. We think that it's, it's all right, well, it's done. I'm never going to see it again, but God's going to bring it back in a different way for a gift, for a future of blessing. It's wild, it's so crafty, but so beautiful. In Matthew 18, it, has to, it talks about this story about forgiveness. And I was just in a, a small Bible study with my family, and we were, we were talking about this, and it came up so perfectly. It says in Matthew 18, Jesus is talking to his disciples about this parable, about forgiving. And it reads like this. At the time, the disciples came to ask Jesus, who is considered, oh, I'm so sorry, not that point. Verse 21, later Peter approached Jesus and said, how many times do I have to forgive my fellow believer who keeps offending me? Seven times? Jesus answered, said, not seven times, Peter, but 70 times, seven times. 
The lessons of forgiveness in heaven's kingdom can be illustrated like this. And he goes on to talk about this story of this guy coming up to the king and saying, I don't have your money, but can you please forgive me? And the king, he eventually says, all right, I'll forgive you. Don't worry about it. And then the guy ends up going to someone else who owes him money, and he, he's choking him, saying, where's my money at? And he doesn't forgive that person who owes him money. See, Joseph made a choice. And in the moment that his brothers came right before him, he had to choose forgiveness. He chose forgiveness. And it was a process. Like I said, it's a process. At one point in the story of Genesis, it says that Joseph was crying so loud that all the houses could hear him. Talk about some pent up, like, emotions. But in Genesis 50, he says, you plotted evil but God turned it into good. And if it weren't for what had happened, these people wouldn't be alive today. So in my translation, he says, thank you guys. Because God turned it to my good. What kind of place of restoration do you have to be to say that? That's only the grace of God. For those of us who have been deeply wounded like Joseph, that can be extremely difficult and feel like an impossible path, especially when we consider, is God good? Can God be trusted? But this is what I've learned over the years, is that God, he is the great refiner. He is the great refiner. And I stand here today as well to tell you that God is good. He can be trusted. He knows what he's doing. But will you go back to go forward? Will you go back to move forward? Because I believe that the present is a window into the past. The journey begins in the present. It leads you to the past so you can thrive, so you can thrive in God's fullness in everything that he has planned for you so you can thrive in the future. But today, this moment right now, you have to make that decision to step into the past. There's some things there that God wants to bring you through and build in you. I can admit today I'm still in that process, but it's such a beautiful process because God is refining me. Because God is refining me. And like a refining fire works with gold, it, 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 it gets out all the impurities. so that the gold is the purest form of gold. Absent of impurities, absent of defects. Our God is that fire. He's that refiner. I remember thinking to myself earlier this week, I'm like, man, what can I share to you guys? If anything, I should be on the opposite side and you should be talking to me because I, I want to learn. I want to know the stories. I want to know how God has moved in your life. There's so much I feel I can, I can learn from each one of you. But I believe that the Lord wants to refine each and every one of you today. He wants to bring about restoration where there's been brokenness. He wants to bring peace where there's been turmoil in your life. If somebody has wronged you, he wants to bring right. He wants to restore. He wants to heal some wounds. He wants to take off the yoke 
that you've been wearing for so many years. And he wants you to forgive. And maybe that's you in this place today who's kind of withheld forgiveness from somebody who's wronged you in the past. I don't know how many times I've seen the story play out where people are, 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 are on their deathbed and they're just like, man, I just wish I had. I just wish I had said I love you one more time. I just wish I had said I forgive you because I don't want to carry this anymore. So if that's somebody here today, I want you to bring to mind that person that has maybe wronged you. And I want you to reach out to them. If there are things in your past, don't be scared because God is God Emmanuel and he's with us. He's going to be with you every single step of the journey. But he wants to bring restoration. Because in order to be restored, you have to be refined. And I want us to go back into this song and just declare this chorus and the bridge a couple times. And if that's you today that wants us to say, Lord, I want to be refined. I want to be restored. I want you to stand up as we sing it together. Because he wants to do that right here and right now. I want to be tried by fire, purified. You take whatever you desire.
God a hand. He's the refiner. I have just one last thing I want to share with you is that we sing this song, Tried by Fire. And I said, God is a great refiner. And the furnace of affliction in the family of God is always for refinement, never for destruction. There's this last few verses in Isaiah I want to close with. Isaiah 43 says, Do not be afraid. I will save you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And when you pass through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go back into the past and find some things that you haven't dealt with, find some skeletons in the closet, I will be with you. Your troubles will not overwhelm you. When you pass through fire, you will not be burnt. The hard trials that come will not hurt you, for I am the Lord your God, the holy God of Israel who saves you. I will give up, I will give up Egypt to set you free. I will give up Ethiopia and Saba. I will give up the whole nations to save your life because you are precious to me. Because you are that precious to me. And because I love you and I give you honor. This is the Lord of all saying, I give you honor. Do not be afraid. I am with you. So Lord, we thank you so much for today. Lord, I thank you for what you've been doing in my life and I understand that it's a process, Lord, but teach me to give grace even when I don't even know how to. Would you teach us to be a people of forgiveness? A people that reflect the Father's heart for every single person who has wronged us, who has spoke against us. Let us be a people of love. Lord, we ask that your fire refines us, that it may take away any blemish or anything that is holding us, any thorn in our side, that we may be able to step into the fullness and thrive in the life that you've created us to live. Lord, we are comforted by those words in Isaiah that say you are with us every single step of the way. When we walk through trials, when we walk through fire, we know that we will not be burnt because you are God, Emmanuel, and a God of his promise. Today is the present, Lord, and we're stepping through that window. And Lord, I pray if there's anybody that we need to forgive or that you place that person in our hearts, that we may go back in order to move forward. Thank you for this word, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' precious, holy name. Everyone said.